3. Lead Me Home Written by A.L. Jackson Narrated by Andy Arndt, Zachary Weber, and Joe Arden Show Me the Way Written by A.L. Jackson Read by Andy Arndt and Zachary Weber Prologue Alabama, 11 years ago Rain pelted from the angry sky, and heavy gusts of wind howled through the trees, which thrashed in the blackened night. In agony, I ran, sure my heart had to be beating as loud as the thunder that cracked through the heavens above. I gasped when my foot slipped on the slick, muddy ground, and I stumbled forward, landing hard on my hands and knees. I cried out, unsure where the pain was coming from, my mind or my heart or my torn flesh. Why would they do this to me? I wept toward the ground, stricken with grief, with betrayal, before I heaved myself back onto my feet, trying to find traction. I staggered toward the house, which was lit up like warmth and light just off the road. Clutching the wooden railing, I propelled myself forward and then flung open the door and fumbled inside. I whimpered in misery when I paused to look around the room. Loss hit me as hard as the storm that raged outside. Why would they do this to me? How could they be so cruel? It took about all I had, but I forced myself to move, knowing I couldn't stay. I had to leave. I had to get away. Choking back sobs, I clung to the banister and hauled myself upstairs into my room. Knees caked in mud and blood, I dropped to the floor and dug out the suitcase from beneath the bed. I staggered to my feet and headed for the closet. Tears clouding my vision, I tore clothes from their hangers and shoved them into the suitcase I'd tossed onto the bed, my movements becoming more frantic with each piece I ripped from its spot. The urge to escape only intensified when I moved to the dresser. Distraught, I ripped the drawers from their rails and tipped them upside down, dumping what would fit into the suitcase. The whole time I struggled to restrain the sobs bound in my throat, to keep them quiet, to pretend it hadn't happened, to pretend I didn't have to do this. With shaking fingers, I tugged at the zipper. Rena, what's going on? The sleepy voice filled with concern hit me from behind. Torment lashed like the crack of a whip. My eyes slammed closed, and the words trembled from my mouth. I'm so sorry, Grandma, but I've got to go. The floor creaked with my grandmother's footsteps. She sucked in a breath when she rounded me, shocked by my battered appearance. Oh, my lord, what happened to you? Her voice quivered. Who hurt you? Tell me, Rena. Who hurt you? I won't stand for it. Vigorously, I shook my head, finding the lie. No one. I just... I can't stay in this stupid town for a second more. I'm going to find Mama. I hated it, the way the mention of my mother contorted my grandma's face in agony. What are you saying? I'm saying I'm leaving. A weathered hand reached out to grip my forearm. But graduation is just next month. You've got to do your speech. Walk across the stage in your cap and gown. Never seen anyone so excited about something in all my life. Now you're just going to up and leave? If you can't trust me, then you can't trust anyone. Tell me what happened tonight. You left here just as happy as a bug in a rug, and now you aren't doing anything but running scared. Tears streaking down my dirty cheeks, I forced myself to look at the woman who meant everything to me. You're the only person I can trust, Grandma. That's why I've got to go. Let's leave it at that. Anguish creased my grandmother's aged face. Rinna, I won't let you just walk out like this. She reached out and brushed a tear from under my eye. Softly, she tilted her head to the side, that same tender smile she had watched me with at least a million times hinting at the corner of her mouth. Don't you ever forget. If you aren't laughing, you're crying. Now, which would you rather be doing? She paused, and I couldn't bring myself to answer. Wipe those tears and let's figure something out, just like we always do. Sadness swelled like its own being in the tiny room. Loss, regret. Like an echo of every breath of encouragement my grandmother had ever whispered in my ear. I can't stay here, Grandma. Please don't ask me to. 
with the plea, my grandmother winced. Quickly, I dipped down to place a lingering kiss to her cheek, breathing in the ever-present scent of vanilla and sugar, committing it to memory. I tugged my suitcase from the bed and started for the door. Grandma reached for me, fingertips brushing my arm, begging. Rinna, don't go. Please don't leave me like this. There's nothing that's so bad that I won't understand, that we can't fix. I didn't slow, didn't answer. I ran, and I didn't look back. Chapter 1 Rinna Leafy shadows flashed across the windshield, interspersed by the blinding strikes of sunlight that burned from the sky as my car passed beneath the heavy canopy of trees where I traveled the winding two-lane road. The closer I got, the harder my heart beat within the confines of my chest, and the shallower my breaths grew. Cinching down on the steering wheel, I peered out at the worn sign on the side of the road. Welcome to Gingham Lakes, Alabama where the grass is actually greener and the people are sweeter. Anxiety clawed through my nerves. It had been eleven years and what felt like a lifetime since I left the small city that could hardly be considered more than a town. I'd promised myself I'd never come back. And there I was. I just wished I had broken that promise sooner, not when it already felt as if it were too late. Earth to Rin! I jumped when the voice boomed through the car speakers. I was losing it. It seemed fitting. I'd been questioning my sanity ever since I'd signed on that dotted line. Are you there, or have I already lost you to the Deep South? Macy asked. I could almost see her raising a dark brow at me. You really are dead set on breaking my fragile heart, aren't you? She continued. You left me here to fend for myself. Not a soul to go out with on Friday nights, and no one to make me miracle hangover breakfasts on Saturday mornings. That's a travesty. Don't you dare shred it more by pretending I don't even exist. BFFs, remember? Don't forget it, or I'll show up with the sole purpose of kicking your skinny ass. Oh, and to get back those black jeans I know you stole. I've been looking for them for the last two days. I bet you have them hidden at the bottom of one of those boxes. I wouldn't dare, I barely managed to tease through the thickness that lined my throat. Where those jeans probably are is under your bed in that disaster of a room. You're worse than a twelve-year-old boy. I was doing my best to inject a smile into my voice, but there was no disguising the hitch in my words as I rounded the bend and the town came into view in the valley below. Gingham Lakes. God, it was beautiful. The valley was a vast expanse of green, flush with abundant, flourishing trees. The massive lake, tucked at the base of the opposite mountain range, appeared little more than a glittering mirage in the far distance, the river so serene and calm where it ran through the middle of the city and segmented it into the two mirrored halves. This place was filled with the best and the worst of memories, with the best of people and the worst of enemies. There was only one person who ever could have persuaded me to return. Leave it to Grandma to do it in the sneakiest of ways. Tell me you aren't having second thoughts, now that you've driven all the way across the country. By yourself, mind you, since you refuse to let me come. You act as if I'd be a nuisance instead of a help. I can lift, like, a thousand pounds. Pretty sure I'm the best mover in all the history of movers. Says the girl who thought it was a good idea to let a box filled with glasses tumble down a flight of stairs rather than carrying it down. Macy chuckled. Don't be jealous. Just add creative to my list of skills. Creator of disasters, you mean? She feigned a gasp. I take full offense to that. I even made pizza and didn't catch the apartment on fire. No, I ribbed. Truth. Quiet laughter rolled free as the heaviness throbbed. I'm going to miss you, Mace. Right then, San Francisco felt a million miles away, an alternate galaxy. Really, it was just a different reality than the one I was headed toward. Somber silence filled the space, and Macy lowered her voice. Are you sure this is really what you want? You left the city you love and an incredible apartment downtown. You resigned from a job any one of us would kill to have. Hell, you were halfway up the corporate ladder. Worst, you left me. My heart clutched while I fought with the urge to turn around and head back to San Francisco. 
I wasn't that broken girl who'd run from Gingham Lakes eleven years ago. I was strong, and I sure as hell wasn't a quitter. You know why I have to do this. I do, and I know how hard it has to be for you. Grief pressed at my spirit, the perfect complement to the determination that lined me like steel. It is, but I need to do this for her almost as much as I need to do it for myself. This city won't be the same without you, Rin. In all the years I'd lived with Macy, I'd only seen her cry once. I knew she was trying to hold it back. Still, the soft sounds seeped through the line, touching me from across the miles. I pressed a hand over my mouth and tried to keep the jumble of emotions that quivered and shook inside me at bay. You'll come visit. She released a soggy laugh. Hell no. There are, like, alligators down there. One look at all my lush, curvy deliciousness, and they'll be inviting their friends over for a feast. I wanted to tell her I was plenty lush when I'd run from this place. The alligators were the least of her worries. I bit it back, keeping all those old insecurities buried where they belonged. You don't think I'm worth the risk? I asked instead. She sniffled, and I swore I could see her grin. Yeah, Rin, you're totally worth it. I cleared the emotion from my throat, wondering how I was going to do this when the road took another sharp curve and the speed limit dropped. I better go. I'm getting into town. Good luck, babe. You've got this. I want you to know I'm proud of you, even though I'm going to miss the hell out of you. Thank you, Mace, I told her. I was definitely going to need it. Chapter 2 Rex my eyes went round and I came to an abrupt stop in her doorway. Are you sure that's what you want to wear? Sweeping a hand through the long pieces of my damp hair, I gave it my all to keep the panic out of my voice. Honestly, I wasn't sure if I wanted to bust out laughing or drop to my knees and cry. Such was my life. We were already ten minutes late and there she was on her bedroom floor wearing a hot pink tutu over a bathing suit. Uh-huh. We got to look so pretty for dance. Annie said all the best dancers wear leg warmies, and her mama bought her all the pretty colors, like a rainbow. She rambled as she tugged on the black high-top converse she talked me into at the mall last weekend. Right over a pair of old tube socks she must have found in one of my drawers. The hideous kind with the two blue stripes at the top that should have been burned years ago. So I got these. She rocked her heels on the ground as she sat back and admired her handiwork. She suddenly looked over at me with that smile that melted a crater right through the stone that was my heart. Her single tooth missing on the bottom row, and her attempt at a bun that looked like she'd just walked out of a windstorm were about the damned cutest things I'd ever seen. I'm the best dancer, right, Daddy? You're the best, prettiest dancer in the whole world, sweet pea Frankie Lee. I just was betting that uptight bitch Ms. Jeslin wouldn't agree. I'd already gotten one bullshit letter about appropriate ballet attire, which was strictly a black leotard with salmon tights, what the fuck, without any runs in them. Apparently, Frankie wasn't living up to those standards. That was what I got for picking Frankie up late from mom's and then coming home and telling her to get ready while I grabbed a quick shower. I'd been at the work site the entire day, had been drenched in sweat and grease and grime, and was trying to put my best foot forward. Problem was, I was having a hard time figuring out how my best could ever be enough. I pressed my palms together in some kind of twisted prayer. Then I dropped them and blew out a resigned breath. All right, then. We need to get out of here before I get you in any more trouble. Frankie hopped onto her feet and threw her hands in the air. Ready! I chuckled beneath my breath, grabbed her dance bag from the pink bench right inside her room, slung it over my shoulder, and extended my hand. Let's go, tiny dancer. Giggling, she pranced over to me and let me take her miniature hand, so small and vulnerable in the massiveness of mine. Following me out the door and down the hall, she skipped along at my side. Innocently. Joy lit up my insides. I swore all her sweetness held the power to blow back the thousand pounds of blackened bitterness built up around my heart. Like when this kid was around, it weighed nothing at all. The day she was born... I'd sworn an oath to myself. I'd never allow her to be torn up by this vicious, cruel world, refuse to let it tarnish her the way it had me. 
My entire life was protecting her from it. I snagged my keys from the entryway table when I heard the sound of a door slamming somewhere outside. Frowning, I leaned back so I could get a glimpse out the window and across the street. An older white Jeep Grand Cherokee was parked in the driveway of Mrs. Dane's old house. Guess they had to finally be putting the place up for sale. Mrs. Dane had lived there forever, long before we'd moved in across the street from her five years ago, but the place had been sitting empty for the last two months. A fist tightened in my gut, grief I really shouldn't be allowing myself to feel. She'd just been so good to Frankie that it had been impossible to keep her shut out. Hell, she'd barged right into our lives like she was supposed to be there, constantly bringing over dinner and those delicious pies from the diner-style restaurant she'd owned downtown. Frankie rushed out the front door and onto the deck at the side of our house. It was the way all the homes were situated in our neighborhood. The houses were elevated from the ground with the main doors located on the side rather than out front. Each had an open deck that extended out from the side of the house, giving a view of the street and neighbors' houses. The porch steps angled that direction and led down to the driveways that came up to the far side of the houses. It probably would have looked strange if not for the big leafy trees that outlined each of the lots. They made everything feel cozy and secluded. Just the way I liked it. It was one of the main reasons I'd insisted on this place when I'd been looking for a fixer-upper to renovate. Frankie released my hand and pointed across the street. Hey, Daddy, look at Someone's at Mrs. Dane's house. Stepping out behind her, I closed the door before I attempted to tame a few pieces of hair that had fallen from her bun and were now flying around her face in the hot breeze. I dropped a kiss to her forehead. It's probably a realtor putting it up for sale, Frankie Lee. Remember how we talked about that? With her head tipped back, she peered at me with confused but hopeful brown eyes. She went to heaven? Yeah, I murmured softly. The screen door at the side of Mrs. Dane's house slammed, and I jerked my head up to find a woman crossing the small deck and jogging down the steps back toward the SUV. God damn. Maybe I was just caught off guard, but just looking at her knocked the air from my lungs. Let's just say I was unprepared for a woman that looked like that. Guess I'd been expecting someone dressed up, older, and there was this girl, disheveled in a sexy, careless way. A massive mound of hair that was wilder than Frankie's was piled haphazardly on her head, wavy pieces falling out all around her. She wore a super tight white tank that disappeared beneath high-waisted jeans. Those jeans should have made her look frumpy and unkempt but instead the whole package sent a skitter of lust racing through my veins and prodding at my dick. She was the kind of woman who could make a grown man stumble on his feet. Stunning. Gorgeous. Too sexy for her own damned good. Or maybe mine. I could call it a complication of abstaining for too long, but I was sure no woman had ever incited a reaction like this in me with just a glance. She raked her arm over her sweat-drenched forehead as she headed straight for the cargo area of the SUV, which was crammed full of moving boxes. I wouldn't mind all that much if she were hauling stuff out of that house directly across the street, but it sure as shit looked like she was moving her things in. Tell me this girl is not moving in next door. I clenched my jaw and grabbed Frankie's hand, needing to get the hell out of there. Come on, Frankie Lee, we've got to get a move on, you're already late. But Frankie was already moving, bouncing down the stairs and along the walkway, waving her free hand in the air, the kid just adding to the stark sunshine that burned bright in the waning day. Hi, 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 I'm Frankie, whose are you? She shouted across the street. Startled, the woman's gaze darted our direction, and the determination in her steps slowed when she caught sight of my daughter. An amused smile grew on the rosy bud of her mouth when her gaze swept the ridiculous outfit Frankie was wearing. She seemed to hesitate for a second, eyes glancing around her like she was looking for something before she changed direction, heading our way. Hey there, Frankie. I'm Corinne Dane, but everyone calls me Rinna. Rinna Dane. What the ever-loving hell? Could damn near feel the bewildered excitement roll through my daughter while I stood there cursing the world that just fucking loved to curse me. Your name's Corinne, too? That's Mrs. Dane's name. She worked at the restaurant called Pepper's Pies and cooked all the pies, and my daddy ate them all, all, all the way gone. Sometimes we went to go eat there, but mostly we ate at my house right here, but now she went to heaven. A bolt of sadness streaked through her expression, and fuck if it didn't hit me, too. 
Still, the smile she wore only grew. She made the best pies in the whole world, didn't she? Frankie's excitement only amplified. Yes! You know Mrs. Dane, too? She started to cross the narrow street, all chestnut hair and java eyes and a body that was built for temptation. Awareness ridged my spine like a steely stake of lightning, and I stepped back, my jaw tightening at the same time I protectively took hold of my daughter's hand. That was all that women were. Temptation. Trouble. Forbidden fucking fruit. Because all they did was condemn you in the end. So I stayed away, kept my distance. If I didn't step into the fire, then I wouldn't get burned. Kneeling in front of my daughter, she stuck out her hand. It's so nice to meet you, Frankie. It sounds like you were a good friend of my grandma's. So yeah, I'd already figured it out. It didn't stop me from flinching. Frankie had stars in her eyes as she enthusiastically shook her hand. She might as well have been meeting Taylor Swift. She told me I was her favorite, favorite friend, and sometimes she even let me go to her house and make some pies. Is that so? Rinna said with a tease in her voice. Yep. Rinna leaned in and I caught a whiff of something sweet. Want to know a secret? She whispered. Frankie bounced on her toes. Oh yes, yes please, I love secrets, I won't tell nobody. Soft laughter floated out from Rinna's mouth, a mouth that was getting harder and harder not to stare at, all plush and pink and perfectly pouty. Well, this is a secret I hope you tell everyone, because guess what? I have some of the recipes for those pies. Frankie's mouth dropped open, and damn it if my stomach didn't fucking growl. You gonna make me some? She gushed. Definitely, Rinna said, taking that moment to look at me with the threat of a smile on her pretty face, the angle of her jaw sharp while everything else about her was soft. That sweet scent was back, billowing in the breeze, this warmth surrounding her. Hot cherry pie. My teeth ground together and the smile slid from her face when she saw what must have been my irritated expression, and I swore I heard the slight catch of her breath when she met my glare. Could see a slight quiver in her throat when she straightened and took a step back. Still, she stood her ground. There was something unwavering about her, like she had something to prove. To herself or me, I wasn't sure. Hi, I'm Rena Dane, was named after my grandmother. She managed though the words were rough as she stuck her hand out toward me like she'd done to my daughter. I just stood there staring at it like it held the venom of a viper bite. Finally, I lifted my chin at her and gathered all the pleasantness I could summon. It wasn't much. Rex Gunner, I'm sorry about your grandmother, and we're late, so if you could excuse us. I gave Frankie a gentle tug of her hand. Come on, Frankie Lee, we've got to get you to dance. Frankie trotted along at my side, looking back over her shoulder with what I knew had to be one of those adorable grins. What a jerk. I heard Rinna mumble behind my back when I turned and led my daughter to the passenger side of my truck. Bitterness burned. Yeah, I was a jerk. An asshole. Whatever. Better to burn bridges before anyone had a chance to cross them. Shaking it off, I hoisted Frankie into the high cabin, making her squeal and pretend like she was flying. I strapped her in her car seat and jogged around to the front. I hopped into the driver's seat, wondering if it were possible for the roar of the engine to cover the hurt that sagged Rena's shoulders as I took to the street. Wondering why I felt like a complete piece of shit when I caught a glimpse of her in the rearview mirror. She just stood there in the twilight like she was caught in a dream, watching us go with disappointment on her face. Befriending a sweet old lady was one thing. Allowing a girl like Rinna Dane into our lives, a girl that made my body react the way it did, now that was pure stupidity. Chapter 3 Rinna Why am I doing this? Anxiety convulsed through my nerves as I waited for my computer to fire up. The truth was, I couldn't not know. I connected to my hotspot and logged on to Facebook. It felt like forever while I sat there, the screen churning, lighting up like a window to the past. I could almost feel it stretching its fingers out to touch me, to tease me with the control it had held over me for so long. For too long. Fingers trembling, I managed to type the name into the search bar, a task I'd attempted at least twenty times before I'd set out on my journey back home. I had never found the courage to press enter. 
Today, I did. She was the third listing, a grainy picture, almost indistinguishable, but I knew it was her. Missouri. She lived in Missouri. I slammed the lid down. That was all I needed to know. As long as she wasn't here, I could totally manage staying in this town. Tell me you're miserable without me. Laughing quietly, I flitted around the kitchen on my bare feet. My cell was pressed between my ear and shoulder as I slowly unpacked the few things I'd brought. I hadn't needed much since my grandmother had left everything she owned to me. Completely miserable, I told Macy, letting the tease wind into my tone as I hiked onto my toes to set my favorite Christmas mug on a high cupboard shelf. Huh, that's weird. I haven't even noticed you're gone, she deadpanned. Says the girl who's called me like ten times today, I ribbed. She giggled. Okay, okay, I might have kind of noticed. Her voice dropped to a whisper. It's just that I think the apartment is haunted. The apartment is haunted? And this happened sometime in the last three days? Skepticism rolled from my tongue. You know how these things work. Ghost girl has been stalking me, and the second she felt your absence, she slid right in to take your place. You know you're absolutely ridiculous, right? Which is precisely why you love me. Affection pulsed. How was I ever going to live without seeing her every day? Honestly, though, Rin, how are you doing there by yourself? It must be weird to be alone in that old house. God knows it's weird around here without you. I paused to look around at my dated surroundings. The floor's linoleum, the cupboards hailing from the early 80s, the beige formica countertops dingy and faded to a dreary yellow. The decor was mainly all the trinkets my grandmother had collected over the years, and the same two floral placemats I remembered from my childhood were still on the small round table. It was as if she'd been waiting for me to return all this time. Next to nothing had changed since I left eleven years ago. The house needed a full renovation. That was when, or if, I ever had the money to do it. Honestly, I still didn't know how I was going to manage to hold on to all these frayed threads if I could come back here and take over where my grandmother had left off. If I had what it would take to breathe life back into everything she had built. But when I inhaled, I could almost smell the lingering memory of sugar browning in the oven. When I focused hard enough, I could almost taste the tart cherries and sweet crust melting on my tongue. When I listened intently enough, I could almost hear the steadfast belief in her voice echoing from the walls. Honestly? Yeah, she said. An old warmth surrounded me, all mixed up with the reservations and fear that had kept me away for so many years. It feels like home, like I never left, like I could walk through the door and my grandmother would be standing right in this kitchen, pulling a pot pie from the oven for dinner. I swallowed over the lump that grew heavy at the base of my throat, the loss that echoed back her presence. I just wish I would have come back earlier, before it was too late. My heart clutched at the memory of the phone call I'd received two months before. A social worker had been on the other end of the line, telling me my grandmother had suffered a massive heart attack while behind the wheel of her car, that though the responders had tried, there had been nothing they could do. She was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. Macy's voice dipped in sincerity. You can't blame yourself, Rin. Even if she didn't know the reason you left, I think she at least understood why. Then why does it feel like such a pathetic excuse now? Maybe I was never lucky enough to meet your grandma in person, but in all the time we lived together, I don't remember a day that passed without you talking to her. So maybe the circumstances sucked, but I promise you that she knew how much you loved her. And you want to know why it feels pathetic now? Because you've moved beyond it, above it. You're not even close to being that timid, insecure girl who answered my ad for a roommate 11 years ago. You've grown, changed. Your grandma got it. That was one smart woman. I exhaled slowly. I know, I just... I wish I would have come back before it was too late. Wished she had let me know she was in trouble. I wished we had more time. But I guessed us Dane women were stubborn that way. I'm betting your grandma didn't see it that way, which is the very reason you're back there now. I gulped around the emotion, voice hushed. Thanks, Mace. 
I needed to hear that. She tisked softly. Of course you did. This is why you have me. From the other end of the line, I heard rustling, could feel her mood changing course as she settled back in the plush couch in the den. I could almost see the glass of red wine in her hand. So, how is it being back in Gingham Lakes so far? Have you run into anyone you know? Her voice turned wry. Tell me you found out Bitchface took a deep dive into the lake and never came back up for air. Or maybe she took a sharp curve driving a little too fast? Which would you prefer? A low chuckle rumbled free. You're horrible, Mace. Psh, don't tell me you haven't imagined it a thousand times. Okay, okay, maybe I imagined her demise a time or two. Like every time I'd closed my eyes for two years after it happened, wondering what it might have been like if I could have turned the tables on her and wishing all the same she could just take it back. What had I ever done to warrant that level of cruelty? Could she possibly have known just how badly what she'd done had hurt? Old memories twisted my stomach into knots. Traces of that evil, depraved laughter touched my ears, visions of her standing there like it had meant nothing at all while she'd destroyed my entire world. It was as if crushing me had been nothing but entertainment. And no, I looked her up. She moved to Missouri. You looked her up? Surprise coded Macy's tone. I just had to. Silence filled the space between us. I get it, she finally said. Bending down, I pulled my coffee pot from the box, puffing out a breath as I did. To answer your question, no, I haven't seen anyone I know. My grandma was right. The city has really grown since I left. It's not filled with familiar faces like it used to be. I stopped by the grocery store this afternoon and didn't recognize a soul. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I sighed. I don't know. Both, I guess. I used to love that I knew everyone that I'd go into the restaurant and knew at least half the people there. It made me feel safe. But after everything, the rumors? My lips pursed. It's nice to be somewhere I love and have a clean slate. It feels like a second chance. I just prayed it remained that way. Well, if there aren't any familiar faces, tell me there are at least some panty-melting ones you've run across. You know, some yummy-to-my-tummy hotties hanging around, waiting to steal your heart. Knowing you're getting some will at least ease some of my worry for you. A scoff scraped my throat. Leave it to Macy. Oh, there's a hottie, all right. But he definitely isn't hanging around waiting to steal my heart. It was that moment when I heard the low rumble of a powerful engine approaching in the distance. Of course. Grandma had always told me all you needed was to speak of the devil and he'd appear. There'd been something about our encounter this morning that had left me unsettled. Something about that gorgeous stranger that had left me restless and curious. Interest peaked. The man was a paradox, hard and brittle and cold. Yet so incredibly gentle with the little girl, who'd clung to his hand as if he were the center of her world. There seemed to be nothing I could do but edge toward the window, stealing to the side to remain out of sight. I pulled back the edge of the curtain and peeked out. Headlights cut into the night, and my stupid heart kicked an erratic beat. That intrigue increased my pulse to a thunder. I was riddled with that same fierce attraction I'd felt when I'd looked up earlier today to find him towering over me, the way my stomach had twisted, and the nervousness that had followed me back to Gingham Lakes took a new form. The headlights grew brighter, illuminating the space between our houses before the monstrous truck slowed and turned into the driveway across the street. Oh, 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 tell me all about it. Someone sounds pouty, and turned on. You know how my luck goes when it comes to men? The scales were always tipped to bad. You shouldn't be surprised that my neighbor is, like, gorgeous. Macy squealed. How gorgeous? I watched as Rex hopped out of his truck and went straight for the back seat. All six feet three inches of mouth-watering deliciousness lit up by the moonlight. Like Greek god with a sledgehammer, gorgeous. I could hear her kicking her feet. And how is this a bad thing? I was pretty sure he would have preferred to drag me to the lake and drown me rather than tolerate my living across the street from them. Them? I met his daughter, too. At least she was super excited to meet me. 
I suppressed laughter as I thought of her rushing out of their house. The little girl had been a perfect kind of disaster, in that hot pink tutu and those atrocious socks she had to have stolen from her dad. She was a bluster of energy and innocence. It was almost worry that entered Macy's playful tone. Oh, God, tell me you're not actually crushing on the married guy next door. That's just poor form, Rin. Through the milky, opalescent night, I watched as he pulled a sleeping Frankie from the back seat and shifted her so her head rested high up on his shoulder. He ran a hand over the back of her head and set a kiss to her temple. The image was so at odds with the hostility he'd met me with earlier. That intrigued attraction flared, my mouth dry as I watched him start up his walkway. Maybe what struck me most was there was something sad about him, too. Something helpless and scared beneath all the harsh, hard dominance he wore so well. Something bitter and broken. I found myself whispering when I came to the realization. I'm thinking there's no wife. No wife? So, he's like, a single dad? Maybe. I uttered so quietly as I peered through the night, drinking in the way his long legs took the steps, and then the way he angled through his front door with his sleeping little dancer girl. I think so. I'm not sure. Why did I want to know so desperately? Why are you whispering? Macy whispered back. I bit down on my bottom lip while guilty silence spun around the room. Macy busted up laughing. Oh my god, you are spying on him right now, aren't you? Shut up, I told her, quick to let the curtain drop. I got straight back to work unpacking. Someone has a crush, she sing-songed. Stop it. I was so not spying, and I so didn't have a crush. I'd just met them, and the worst thing I could do was get mixed up with the angry guy across the street with his sweet, adorable little girl, who was a big fan of my grandmother. Apparently, she had really good taste. But her dad? He obviously had some ginormous chip on his shoulder, and I had enough to worry about without giving thought to the flecks of sadness scored in the depths of his eyes. Eyes the color of sage, rimmed in the darkest gray. No, I wasn't thinking about those soft, full lips barely hidden by the sexy scruff on his strong jaw, and I definitely hadn't noticed his big hands or the strength in his deeply tanned, muscled arms. Nope, not at all. A guy like that had heartache written all over him, and I'd had enough of that to last me a lifetime. The sound of a whisk clanging against metal echoed through the kitchen. With the bowl tucked under one arm, I cut butter into the flour in the other, giving myself over to the sense of deep peace that had taken me over. The late night was like a warm blanket wrapped around the old house, holding me safe and secure, the vast silence a comfort as I slowly swayed in the kitchen. I had the crumpled letter smoothed out on the counter beside me where I worked. Every so often I would peek over at it, relishing in her presence. I had to have read it close to a million times since it had slipped out with the file the attorney had given me two months ago, but I kept going back to it, wondering why now? Why hadn't she asked this of me before? When you left, you told me I was the only one you could trust. Your broken heart had mine breaking that night. Isn't it funny how things come around? Because no matter how many years have passed, in the end, you are the only one I trust with this. I know right now you're scared and questioning my intentions, but I'm asking you to trust me one last time. I made a life within those walls, gave it my whole heart. Maybe you never realized it, but all along, I was working so one day I could give it to you. Now, it's yours. Give it life, Corinne Paisley. I'll be with you every step of the way. My chest tightened as a wave of grief and love slammed into me. I could feel the weight of her spirit dance around me, soft, soft encouragement, the same as she'd always given me. Belief. It was right there, shining with all the questions that still remained. I am scared, Grandma. I'm not sure how I can do this without you. But I promise you that I'm going to try. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make you proud. I jumped when the oven dinged, letting me know the temperature had reached 375 degrees. Maybe I really was letting this old house get to me. I set the bowl aside and dug into the paper sack to find the almond extract. 
Almond extract, I was certain I'd purchase this afternoon at the store. Almond extract that wasn't there. With a frown, I sank back onto my heels. Frustration leaked into my veins. Damn it. My first pie, and I was already failing. It was one of those ingredients I could probably get away with not using, but it just wouldn't be the same. Looking around, my attention landed on the pantry. Let's see what you've got, Grandma, I mumbled, opening the pantry door and rummaging through the few items that hadn't already been discarded. Aha! It was a cry of victory as I held the bottle of almond extract in the air. Victory that was short-lived. It had expired three years ago. Damn it, I muttered again. I tossed it into the garbage bin right before my eye caught on a white envelope tucked on a shelf at the side of the pantry wall. Like a forgotten partner to all the expired spices and extracts, a token of the past. Apprehension swelled, anxious and uneasy, and I slowly moved forward. It felt as if it were some kind of secret, as if I were on some kind of forbidden mission. Silly, I knew, but my fingers trembled when I reached in and tugged it free. The paper tacked to something sticky on the pantry wall. That anxiousness thickened like molasses, my throat full and bobbing, my stomach twisted in a vice. My name was written across the front, the familiar handwriting scratchy from an unsteady hand. Oh, God! Grief came swooping back in, but I smiled through the tears that were suddenly clouding my eyes as I ripped into the letter. There was so much comfort in knowing she felt confident that one day I would find what she'd left for me. I tugged it out and quickly scanned the card. All moments matter. We just rarely know how important they are until the chance to act on them has already passed. My spirit flooded with love, and I clung tight to the reminder of this amazing woman who'd always viewed the world as if it were right on the cusp of something magical. The tough times nothing but a stepping stone to propel us to where we were supposed to be. I took a fumbling step back when I sensed the change outside my kitchen window. A light had flickered on across the street. Drawn, I inched across the creaking floor, again keeping myself hidden as I crept toward the window. I pulled back the edge of the lacy drape and peered that direction, not sure if I felt guilty for doing it or if it was somehow my duty. Because this time there was no question I was spying unable to look away, somehow knowing I didn't want to. The bulk of him took up the entirety of his kitchen window. His hair, which was a dark golden blonde and a little long on top, was in complete disarray and stuck up in all directions. As if he'd spent the night tossing in bed, waging a war I didn't understand. I couldn't make out his expression with the way he had his head dropped between his shoulders, his hands most likely propped on the counter to hold himself up but that didn't mean I couldn't clearly see him fighting with whatever demons plagued him. Shit, I whispered, clutching the letter in my hand, waging my own war. The battles I'd once fought in this town had been lost. The memories of them stalled me with trepidation. The strength I'd found through the years away coming against them and instilling me with courage. I glanced at the letter again, and I chose to take a chance. Before I could think better of it, I moved through the arch and out into the dated living room. I slipped on my sandals I'd left by the door. Then I let myself out into the muggy Alabama night, the air heady with wafts of honeysuckle and fresh-cut grass. Moon, huge and high, cast the slumbering houses and trees in a silvery glow, and the steady trill of cicadas danced all around. It felt like stepping straight back into my childhood. The memories of the nights I'd spent on the porch with my grandmother staring up at the stars seemed so close it felt as if I only had to reach out to go back to that time. Inhaling the vestiges, I kept my footsteps as light as possible. Even still, they crunched against the gravel driveway, and I sucked in an emboldened breath when I stole through the night and across the street, silently making my way up his walkway. Carefully, I climbed his steps hand on the railing as if it offered moral support, and crossed his freshly stained deck. I stopped at his door, my heart the thunder that incited a storm within my chest. What was I doing? This was insane. This guy hated me for no apparent reason at all. Still, I found myself lifting my hand, my fist quietly knocking at his door. 
I was shaking all over by the time the latch turned and the door flew open, and I was again met with the same unwarranted fury from earlier. Although this time it was harder. All of it. His scowl and his glare and every gloriously defined ridge of his body. Oh, my God. There was nothing I could do to keep my eyes from dropping to explore the wide expanse of exposed flesh. His shirt was missing, and he was wearing nothing but boxer briefs. I gulped. That foolish attraction drenched me through, wet and hot and sticky, flaming free and leaving me weak in the knees. My gaze latched on the tattoo that ran the entirety of his left upper arm. It was a landscape of a jagged cliff with a waterfall pouring over the side. The splashes rising up from the seething pool of water were bright, colorful feathers that floated and twisted as if blown by the breeze. Sorrow and hope. They were so clearly impressed into the depiction. What are you doing here? The severity in his voice cut through the night, impaling my stupor, jerking my attention up to his face. Of course, it had to be equally as striking as the rest of him, powerful and dominant. I shook as I took a fumbled step back. Oh wow, this was stupid. So damned stupid. Still, I lifted my chin. I was just... I fumbled for an excuse to be standing at his door at one in the morning, wondering if you had any almond extract. His head cocked, and if it were possible, his eyes narrowed even more. Do I look like I have almond extract? Um, I stammered. Great. I was a blubbering fool. This man set me totally off balance. He was so different from the men I was used to back in San Francisco. Rougher, unpolished and raw. More dangerously beautiful than any man had the right to be. Maybe it was because he reminded me a tiny bit of Aaron, the asshole back in high school who'd had a hand in the breaking of my heart. But this was more. Different. Everything about Rex Gunner was unique blinding in his darkness, warm in his coldness. I just... I gestured back to my house across the street. I was making my grandma's cherry pie and was missing almond extract when I saw a light on over here. I thought I would take a chance. All moments matter. We just rarely know how important they are until the chance to act on them has already passed. Was this one of those moments that mattered? And why did I feel like I had to take this chance? Chapter 4 Rex Lust sieged my body as I stared at her standing in the moonlight like some kind of vision. Like some kind of wicked enchantress with the face of an angel. Baking my fucking favorite pie nonetheless. Her scent was all around me, cherries and sugar. My mouth watered and I clenched my fists in an effort to keep myself from reaching out and taking a taste for myself. Maybe I was still back in bed and this was just a new element of the nightmares that haunted me night after night. If this were a dream, I'd be inviting her in and sinking into that tight body, fucking her hard and wild. Just the way I liked it. That would be ripping me apart. Hell, with the way she was looking at me, it was clear she was already poised to tear me to shreds. Some chances aren't worth taking, I said, voice rough with warning. She needed to know she was crossing into territory where she wasn't welcome. Banging on my door in the middle of the night was completely off limits. How could this girl possibly think this was okay? I set my forearm high on the jam, knowing every inch of me was bristling with the challenge. All except for my dick. Apparently that was the only part of me that didn't seem pissed off at the intrusion. Her strong chin lifted in her own challenge. No? Haven't you ever heard you never know if you don't try? And how many doors have gotten slammed in your face because of that philosophy? More than I could count. And why do I get the feeling you're about to add another to that number? A disbelieving chuckle rumbled in my chest. This girl was all kinds of grit and determination. I'm easy to read, I guess. A tiny snort huffed from her nose. Hardly. She angled her head and those warm eyes turned almost pleading. Listen, I'm going to be living right across the street. Just the thought of it left me antsy and agitated. Her voice softened. I don't know anyone around here anymore, and it'd be nice to have a friend. I thought maybe you and Frankie could use one too. Laughter ripped up my throat. 
cruel and low. Sorry, but I have all the friends I need, and I'd appreciate it if you stayed away from my daughter. She doesn't need anyone else making her promises they have no intention of keeping. Before I could do something stupid, I slammed the door shut in her face, exactly the way she'd been expecting me to do. I leaned my back against the wood, trying to catch my breath to slow the raging in my spirit, that part of me that hated being such an asshole, all the while trying to remind myself why it was necessary. There was something about her that set me on edge, left me feeling off balance. Self-control was not normally something I lacked, and fuck, it wasn't like she was out there offering herself up like a warm slice of pie. But just looking at her had me itching for a taste. I could feel her on the other side, her presence that swept the air unsettled and thick, like I'd caused her physical pain with the rejection and she was projecting it right back to me. Maybe she really was just trying to be nice. Maybe she didn't have ulterior motives. But that was a chance I just couldn't take. Fear tumbled through his veins and clanged in the hollow of his chest. Frantic, he stumbled through the brushy undergrowth, the world buried by soaring trees. Branches lashed at the exposed skin of his arms and thorns latched onto the fabric of his shirt in an attempt to hold him back. It propelled him harder, faster. He screamed her name. Sydney. 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 The howl of wind answered back. Sydney. I shot upright, chest heaving as I struggled to catch my breath, to orient myself to the movement that jostled me awake and pulled me from the dream. Daddy, 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 wakey, 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 I made you breakfast. Frankie was grinning at me as she jumped on my bed, brown hair wild and free, just as wild and free as the way she looked at the world, at the way she loved, wholly and without reservation. I scrubbed both palms over my face, dropped them just as fast. It was not all that hard to return her grin. Her expression alone was enough to chase away the exhaustion that constantly weighed me down. The few hours of sleep I managed were restless, plagued with the curse that darkened my life. I swallowed back the fear, the terror that one day it might steal her from me too. You made me breakfast? I asked, voice groggy, my touch tender as I brushed her two long bangs back from her innocent face. That's awful nice of you thinking of your daddy first thing in the morning. She giggled. Of course I thinks about you, Daddy, and I made a whole big bowl because Grammy says you could eat a whole cow. Oh, she did, huh? She nodded emphatically, her eyes going wide when I hopped up and tossed her over my shoulder. Frankie roared with laughter, a kid dressed in shorts and a tee with that same damned hot pink tutu around her waist. So fucking cute. That Grammy is going to be in big, big trouble when I see her today. I teased my daughter, who was bouncing on my shoulder as I started running with her down the hall. She squealed, kicking her feet and holding on to me for dear life. Oh no, don't tell Grammy, it's our secret. I thought you said you were good at keeping secrets. Damn it. The last thing I needed to do was bring up the conversation she'd had with Rena yesterday. Just the mention of that woman had fantasy slamming me from all sides, her face and her hair and that body, sweet mouth-watering sugar. I'd thought maybe the morning would have scraped the idea of her from my consciousness. No such luck. I shoved off the thoughts, refusing to give them voice. That was right when I came to an abrupt stop when I entered the kitchen I'd just finished remodeling. Frankie scrambled upright, pushing those unruly locks from her face with both hands, a hopeful smile plastered on her face. I might have spilled a little milk, Daddy. Is that okay? I'm gonna clean it all gone, but I didn't want your cereal to get all gross and swaggy. Bleh. Her nose scrunched and her lips turned down as if she'd tasted something sour. I frowned when I saw a little milk was actually the entire gallon, minus what she'd managed to pour into the cereal bowl. A pool of white swam between the small table set for two and the refrigerator against the far wall, the emptied plastic container floating in the middle of it. Her shoulders went to her ears, her voice quieting. Is he mad? Hugging her close, I pecked a kiss to her chubby cheek. Of course I'm not mad. We're just going to have to get you to the gym with me so we can start building up these muscles. I lightly squeezed her tiny bicep. How's that sound? You ready to start pumping some iron? Before you know it, you'll be as strong as the Hulk. She giggled like it was the funniest thing she'd ever heard. The Incredible Hulk? You're crazy, Daddy. I'm going to be Wonder Woman. Don't you know I'm a girl?
She threw both her arms in the air before she started shimmying down my body, getting free of my hold and heading straight for the drawer where we kept the dish towels. She climbed up the step stool so she could reach it, that smile lighting up the whole room when she looked over at me. All right, Daddy, can I be the best dancer in the whole world and Wonder Woman? I crossed the kitchen to help her clean up the mess. Yeah, tiny dancer, you can be whatever you want to be. I'd make sure of it, because she was the single wonder of my life. I'd do whatever it took to keep her that way.